texted me when I asked for his service for uh, I mean for Grab. He texted me that he cannot go into this uh, airport uh, lane because he doesn't have enough money for his touch and go. So then I texted him back, please pick me up at the usual place. Then he picked me up at the roadside, so I'm okay. Then when I entered, and I asked him, what are you doing? So I'm a student, what are you doing? I, I'm taking Grab. Why do you do Grab? I said, oh, I do Grab because my father don't finance me. And he said he applied for scholarship here and there, he couldn't get. So, but the thing that he, he did was that he, his father never, uh, he does, his father stopped financing him since he was, uh, since he finished his SPM. And he said he was lucky that his father did not finance him because he know uh, the meaning of hard life. You know, he has to earn his own income in order to finance his study. So he, 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 he do a grab part-time work as a grab driver. And, um, and I told him he's on the right track because he's doing finance and his GPA is very good. And, and then he's doing his internship soon. And I asked him, how did you get your internship? Oh, because he joined the Maybank uh, challenge. Eh? I think Unimas, we used to do that, where Maybank came, come to our university, you know, in the past, and they uh, actually recruited students through some kind of test program, or what do you call that? What do you call that in, in, in you do uh, physical tests, you do, you know, uh, physical, uh, the tests for the students, eh? not recruitment, eh? what do you call that? Uh, assessment, yeah, they call it assessment, they do direct assessment. So this is again another things I think that we need to address, not only in terms of statistic itself, we have to look at the qualitative part of it, uh, Doctor, especially in terms of skill. And I don't have to mention what are the skills that are being sought after by the employers. You have seen those skills. Of course, communication is always over and over and over again. We talk about communication skill is always being sought after, it's critical skill, and uh, we have analytical skills. But for technical skill, maybe they have the technical skill, but what about the soft skill? So these are the things that we need to learn from the statistic because it tells us the same thing. Skills, a mismatch, uh, low wage, uh, low quality jobs, you know, and graduate employability, we look at the definition of graduate employability, it's it, regardless of whatever job you do, you are considered as employed, isn't it? Yeah? Even if you are uh, still doing your upskilling or training, you're still considered as employed. So we have to relook look at how we define and how we deep dive into identifying what is actually graduate employability. Graduate employability is ensuring that your skills are able to fit the industries. You are able to use your skill to fit the job. It doesn't have to be within your field of studies because I met chemical engineers who do human resource and they are great human resource manager. So that, that's my response to this question. So we need to look deeper into these issues of not just look at the statistic, because statistic tells you a lot, but you need to really deep dive into it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right, I would like to ask the next question to Ms. Chu. Dr. Zul, you have alluded me. Right, we all know the problem is, we know the, the challenges. Here we are trying to find solutions, trying to connect the dots. If there is any possible way that we can do some small initiative to at least address some of the solution. We are not looking at a, a, a magic bullet that tries to solve all the solutions, but I think this is where our platform is. Half of our participants here are from the industry, half of us from the universities. I hope you will take this time to start talking to each other and work together trying to address this problem once and for all. Now, Seek Asia, you are a leading company that operates finding employment platforms. My graduates, a lot of the time, I take them to courses how to write CV, looking at what has happened this morning. No, your degree doesn't come. No, the number of experience does not count. The currency all the speakers have talked about is skills and skills and skills. How is it at the SIG Asia? Who get hired? Who I mean, we know the skills, but um, if you could deep dive and share with us your insights, what's there in SIG Asia? Thanks, Dr. Zulina. Um, yeah, just, just to share, SIG is actually the parent company for JobStreet, so I'm going to quote um, the, you know, some of the trends from JobStreet.com itself. Um, so if 
just to set a bit of context, um, if we look at last year, last year was the great recovery from COVID. So the jobs actually grew a lot. We are talking about 60 to 70% because there was a big hit during COVID when you know, hiring was um, very slow. Right? So if we look at um, the national trend now uh, for this year, we, we just passed the H1 of this year. Um, it is actually a slight dip compared to last year by about 8%. Now that's still not too bad because if you think about the great recovery, um, this is basically a little bit more of a conservative view. Um, there are kind of worries about the economic outlook in general. Um, therefore, it's a little bit more conservative overall. Now, that's on um, you know overall basis. If we deep dive um, into some of the industries that are hiring, actually the top industries that are hiring are really the usual suspects: manufacturing, retail, um, FMB, construction, IT, um, as well as banking. I mean, they, they are the long list, but these are the ones on the top. Um, and we do see that they continue to hire at a good pace, um, especially the recovery continues for sectors like retail um, as well as FMB. Um, actually, they grew quite a lot this year as well compared to last year. We are talking about 35% and 26% respectively. Um, if we dive into an interesting industry such as tech, which has I think quite a bit of news recently of a lot of retrenchment. Um, we do see the slowdown regionally, if we talk about, because we were also uh, present in six countries around the region as well. So regionally, we do see around 18% drop um, in terms of the IT industries. Um, again, you know, like uh, it, 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 is, it is what it is, but uh, it's not a big concern at this point just because it's grown so much. So it's a little bit of a cooling off period. But in Malaysia, uh, the good news is the, we do see the tech jobs on our platform is still maintaining. It's not growing as much, but at least it's maintaining. Uh, in general, I would say that the, the jobs are there. Or to your questions, you know, the, the skill requirement and all that. I think we'll deep dive a little bit further, so maybe I'll just stop at trends. Um, I just took a look at uh, today's job listing uh, on jobstreet.com, and there's over 55,000 job offerings, uh, you know, posted by the employers. It does look quite good still. Um, is really seeing how, you know, the graduates and how the job seekers can get the jobs? That's the question here. Thank you. Thank you for that, that information. Right. I'm going to ask our, uh, the next question to the next person is uh, Ms. Nurmastura. Welcome. Right. LinkedIn. Again, um, as um, University of Malaya, we actually subscribe to LinkedIn to get the best talents. So can you just share with us What's inside there? Who's asking for jobs? Um, the profiles of job applicants, please. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Um, yeah, thank you, University of Malaya, also, for being uh, choosing LinkedIn to choose the talent pipeline, I can see. So I'm, I'd like to start with LinkedIn just reached to 950 million members in the global workforce. Uh, from Malaysia's standpoint, we have 7 million members. 7 million members meaning that all of you have LinkedIn profile, isn't it? How many of you have LinkedIn, by the way? Can I see a hand for that? <laughs> quite a numbers, uh, quite a numbers here, right? So please do connect each other after this through LinkedIn. And in Malaysia, we have 7 million members who have LinkedIn profile and it's equal to two-thirds of our workforce. Because Malaysia workforce ada lebih kurang berapa? 16 juta kan? So dekat LinkedIn ada 7 million uh, members. So with this data, we see in term of every minute, one minute, eight person hired through LinkedIn. That's the stats from us, right? And in terms of like the other fun facts about LinkedIn, I would like to share, to share here is um, LinkedIn processes 117 job application every second. There's a lot of numbers and I can say in terms of uh, 61 million members look for jobs every week. 
This is across the global. And our vision is to become increasingly urgent during times of change right now. And we create opportunity for every members, employers here, seeking for a right talent. Sometimes the same talent have similar degree, right? Degree in computer sciences. What makes every single candidate difference is the skill they have. The certification or added value, as, as we can say. And it's different based on the university offering of programs. So um, when we talk about syllabus, yes, that is a syllabus, a compulsory syllabus for every graduate student to go through for three years, four years uh, education journey. But and up, what will be the added value in terms of skill? For example, um, software engineer with Microsoft certification Power BI, compared to students who only have degree in uh, software engineering. That's the difference in terms of the market needs and in, in the demand uh, at LinkedIn. That's, that's what we can see. And as LinkedIn members in Malaysia, seven million, and Malaysia workforce is sixteen million. The top three industry. Um, by employment in Malaysia. This is from LinkedIn Insight and Data because we, we, we don't tally our data with Dawson, with Pekin, so, 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 and so on. We see the talent flow, the attrition, the movement of skills in the platform. Um, that's how LinkedIn, the that giant data monster in the global workforce. Um, top three industries by employment in Malaysia are manufacturing, it's tally with the Dawson just now, wholesale and retail, uh, plus the financial services. It's a quiet fast um, in terms of the job being posted, consistent compared to other industry. And what about the three skills in demand in Malaysia? Number one is uh, cloud computing, data analysis and artificial intelligence. So I can say it's like a digital transformation took place since past pandemic, post pandemic. And the top three emerging jobs in Malaysia are digital marketing specialists. There's a lot of social media, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, and a lot. So the demands on the digital marketing to make the businesses run through is needed. The second one is a full stack engineer. And the third one is a data analyst. It's more on digital uh, and tech, tech support, uh, technology based uh, jobs. Um, despite, in terms of the, we can see in the pattern from, if you subscribe to LinkedIn Economic Graph, you just simply go to LinkedIn Economic Graph and subscribe to the newsletter, right, in terms of the jobs labor market report for APEC region, Asia Pacific region. January 2023 to June 2023, in terms of the job been posted, facing some declining, meaning that employers doesn't post most jobs at the moment. So they go as a status quo and internet, in, in, mobilizing internal talent, I can say, because a cost to reskill and upskill internal talent compared to searching for a new talent is a difference. It's a different price, uh, right? So at LinkedIn, that's how we see in terms of the changes, the top three industry, the top three jobs. And allow me to share some sort of like fastest growing skill comparison from Malaysia, Indonesia, and India. All right, this is from LinkedIn Talent Insight. This is a LinkedIn Solutions. Um, from Malaysia's standpoint, our top Skills is operations, customer relationship management, CRM, analytical skill, and customer satisfaction. Whereas Indonesia and India are leading to digital skills in their most of job posting. So tadi kalau saya cakap pasal job in demand, but now is dalam banyak banyak job posting dekat Malaysia, India dan Indonesia, majikan cari apa? What they are looking for? So in India and Indonesia, they are looking for SEO, Search Engine Optimization, OOP, Object Oriented Programming, uh, Data Analysis, GitHub. Very specific. Because the number of members pun berbeza. Malaysia ada 7 juta. Kalau Indonesia ada 16 juta members. And India ada 74 juta members. So the different needs and different population and different, I can say, government initiative took place here. And the last but not least is... Um, we are doing good. Malaysia, we are currently doing good in terms of these skills, operations, CRM, analytical skills. However, we need to improve digital skills, especially the cloud computing data analysis on top of business skills. 
This is a soft skill, still needed, yes. <laughs> we still need to communicate, we still need to um, establish a good leadership. So leadership, communication, management, collaboration is still as a top soft skill needed in the market. So I think that's all for the first round in terms of what LinkedIn insight and data here, I would like to share with all of you. Thank you so much. Uh, Prof, can I just yes, add please. a very short one actually. I just want to share what MEF survey shows us in, uh, in 2022. Uh, what, is the, what are the employers' expectations of newly recruited graduates? Still around the skill issues. One is of course able to apply core knowledge learned in university at the workplace. And we have employers telling us that they must be able to demonstrate engagement and willingness to take extra assignment and independent work, they can apply independent, they work independently and apply the soft skill. And of course, able to perform multitasks in a high performing, high performing teamwork. And also we look at our survey between 2022 and 2023, we look at how uh, the percentage of employers hiring freeze, the freezing, eh, the freezing of hiring. It has actually gone down in 2023 where it used to be 6% of employees says they will freeze hiring, but in 2023, we, we, we noticed that only 3.7% of those companies freeze hiring. Yeah, that, that's, it shows us that the market is actually there, the demand is there, but what type of jobs is available? Like you said, finance, you know, we have uh, critical occupations, finance, uh, business executive, uh, digital, and also uh, software engineers, those are the jobs that are actually highly in demand. And it actually, this, this information are actually consistent across different platforms. So, so we have uh, uh, Talent Corp. I, I've done that, that analysis. It is consistent. So I think as far as graduate is concerned, there are jobs available, but you need to really be able to, uh, what do you call it? To ensure that you can win the heart of the recruiters. Actually, MEF, last, this year, we were looking for consultant. Our consultant needs to know a lot about uh, industrial relations, human resource, uh, labor laws, and also doing membership drive, uh, providing workshop and courses to employers. And when we interviews, we can't find the suitable person. We can find, but those people are already in the market. They earn like 15,000 and 25,000 or 20,000. We can't employ them. So usually graduates of this job, even though we want to offer them 10,000, we can't because they can't do the job. So we can't offer the jobs to graduate also because this job requires you with highly skilled and highly experienced. I think Dr. Linda, you are here also, my colleague. We are looking for research manager in our company. And we couldn't find it because we can't employ fresh graduate if they cannot apply the skills as researcher in the workplace. So these are the issues. I think they need to upskill themselves. They need to reskill themselves. So otherwise, they will end up doing low quality jobs. So I think for the graduates, it is important for you to actually get the skill, not just what you learn at the universities. And another job that we are looking at is also uh, human resource manager, I've said just now, we're looking at consultant, we're looking at data analytic, this and also very difficult to get someone who can really do data, data, data analytic. Right. Thank you. But as, 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 as overall, hiring is there. Right, thank you. Thank you very much for that information. Okay, um, I want a slightly different question. Now, our focus was very much fresh graduates. Uh, I want to bring my perspective as the registrar, where I am talent, uh, managing talent present workforce. You guys have been telling me they all need to be reskilled. The skills are da 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 da. That means for me, I have to invest in providing the upskilling, in providing the reskilling. If you could share some of the best practice that, you know, um, there's a lot of investment there to, to actually upgrade. And you also mentioned in some fields, there is a freeze on taking new talents. So for me, I, I would then therefore want to upgrade my present workforce to have that, to address that skills, you know, the, the skills gap. Do you have any stories of success stories that I can actually, you know, learn from? So are you referring to success story among industry? Yes. 
Well, if I if I am an industry, if I want to get someone to work with me, first thing I look is your attitude, yeah, and of course your skill. Even if you are four flat student, if you don't show me your potential, I won't employ you, yeah. You have to look at that. And most of companies, when they do recruitment, they go direct. They go direct recruitment. You know, you can imagine going through 200 and 300 uh, CVs. When when I want to look for consultant uh, for to replace me. And we receive a lot of CVs. I don't have time to look for all the CVs for employers. We don't have time. Recruiters, we, we, we really want to get the job done. So for the best practices, when learning a lesson from most companies, like, uh, I mean, I can share some of the companies, what they did in the past. Like, I think uh, DG or Maybank, the way they do recruitment is they really deep dive into the the, the attitudes and also the capabilities, of the course, communications, uh, interpersonal skill, this is what they are looking. I think technical skill, yes, they will look at it, but technical skill, you can still learn, actually, in the job. But culture and also attitude is very hard to change. So I always tell my student when I was a lecturer, whatever culture, whatever attitude you have in your class, you will always bring it to the industry. If you are always coming late to class, that is what you are going to be in the workplace. If you're lazy to learn, if you just cut and paste, you are going to be a cut and paste person also in the industry. So that, that's, that's, that's what I'm going to say. But best practices, yes, I said we go direct to the industry. We do it, and we, as an industry, we are actually doing continuing, uh, what do you call it, continuing education and training. Of course, we have HRDC, Human Resource Development Corporation, that is a funding. But that funding is not available for students. That funding is only available for employed persons. Funding that are available for uh, graduates are KPT funding, you know, like ProTG or maybe uh, Slim in the past. And now I think the state, the state Department also, they have a lot. We have Talent Suite. Those are funding available for us. And so grab those, those funding. And from my experience as GE, um, those who jaga GE, eh, when I was in the GE, sometimes KPT give courses. Students don't want to come. We give them free courses, but they said they're not interested. I don't know whether you are sharing the same issues. I've tried very, very hard to encourage students to come to my reskilling program. And I know that it's very, very useful. They, they are quite reluctant to come. They don't think that these this short courses or this micro-credential is good for them. But I think micro-credential is very, very important. That's why KPT also going into micro-credentials. That's why we in the academy, we have an academy. Uh, Malaysian Employers Federation, we also have academy because we also upskill our own members. No, because things change. Labor law change. Skills change. You know, technical skills change. So we establish our Malaysian Employers Federation Academy and we train our employees. Let alone students, they need to be trained. You cannot just put the student there and leave them on their own. You still have to upskill them and continuous, continuously train them. That's a best practice. Thank you. Yeah, you've, you provide many one solution. They, uh, they can actually gain, they can actually uh, upskill by micro credential, which I think I have not actually explored that and make it to the fullest potential. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, Ms. Chung, I, I'm sure you have seen so many CVs from university students, graduates. And then again, you can see the, the trends. Some of them has been out there, has not been able to find jobs. If you could share with us some, some advisory for us, I mean, like, how can we help in? Yeah, I actually have a story, but maybe I just, before I kind of share the story, just a little bit of... Um, um, sharing from a research that we did last year. So if you go to Job Street, you can download the 2022-2023, the Malaysia Job Outlook Report. Um, and in that survey, there's a lot of information, of course, in, in terms of the you know, trends of the, the, the number of jobs and whatever not. But it also um, have some questions around, you know, like what what are the criteria that the employers look at, right, when they hire? So specifically, you'll be interested in this. Um, specifically, there's the top three criteria of hiring fresh graduates from the employer side, right? Um, the number one is actually looking at the interview performance. Number two is field of study, and followed by the attitude or including the punctuality exhibited during the recruitment process, right? So. You know, like for fresh graduates, um, 
employers do understand that you don't have the industry experience, but these other criteria then becomes a little bit more important for fresh graduates. Not that punctuality is not important for us all, right? it's still important, but this is you know, like a gauge of attitude as well. Um, so something to be aware of. And if we talk about generally, not just fresh graduate, generally, what are the top criteria of offering a person's job? Actually, it's not qualification. The first one is actually relevant skills and work experience. Maybe not surprising. Huh? The second one may be a bit surprising, or maybe not, is actually salary expectation. Um, in, in that, there is often a budget that is put forth by companies and, you know, they have to juggle budget, so to say. So salary expectation is also an important criteria and then followed by uh, the qualification. So we kind of look at responses from employers. Um, I think there's a few key takeaways here. If first, firstly, um, the, the fresh graduate ones, right, it feels like the employability skills um, you know, we should fo focus on it to help them to succeed as early as possible. I mean, the fundamental things, even like your know, interview skills, it's not to be taken for granted because these are the, the ones that kind of help you succeed, right? Um, and things like the, the, the etiquette part of it, right? So, uh, you know, all this I call employability skills. So I think, you know, like that has to be focused on. And then if you look at the longer term, we have to not only help them get the first job, but how do they progress and succeed in the job market for years to come, right? So we look at the relevant skills and work experience that's very much needed and required by the employers. So if we dissect like, you know, the skills and, and, and work experience, really like how I think you know the higher institute of learning can help is really to re make sure that uh, the connection with the industry and i see a lot of employers here right so which is great you know like that continues to happen continues to be really up to date continue to really incorporate a lot of all this um you know industry uh, relevant experience into the in modules into the curriculum i think that needs to happen and the second part of it, uh, takeaway, I would say, staying relevant, right? Staying relevant, and I'm not talking about just studying here to stay relevant, but like 10 years down the road, how does one stay relevant? Um, it is also equipping them with the necessary soft skills that's required, right? breaking down problems, the problem-solving skills, the ability to, to have the motivation for lifelong learning, the mentality there, right? How do we kind of in, inculcate this in everyone, right? All our students. Just to tell you a bit of story, now my story comes in. Actually, in our company, there's this uh, fascinating lady, which is really an inspiration to everyone, right? She comes in as a legal, she's a lawyer. She comes into our legal team as a legal advisor six years ago. Um, and then she wanted to do something else. She progressed into being a product manager, right? So, which is very different, I think. Um, and then now she's actually progressed further to become a senior strategy manager. Now, it looks like three different jobs, and it is three different jobs, right? But it is the fact that she has the transferable skills that makes her successful and her drive and her transferable skills, right? For example, the, the fact that she can take very complex problem, break down into simple chunks, and problem solve, those are very, very important transferable skills. Even if you're a lawyer, you can transfer to be a product manager successfully um, if you are able to exhibit you know, that kind of you know, skills capability uh, and work output as well. Thank you very much. Yeah, there's a lot of information there for me to digest. Uh, for us as a uh, university, you know, taking care of the, uh, uh, making sure that our students get employed. Okay, LinkedIn, anything else that you would like to add from what Chung, Ms. Chung has mentioned? Okay. Um, 
So to address this one, I'd like to bring um, how I started my journey. Lah. So I saya pun daripada pelajar IPTA, University of Science Malaysia. <laughs> That's my degree in pure sciences, chemistry, I can say. It took me four years. Another students or my friends uh, should finish their studies in three years, right? So I'm not talking about that, but in terms of move forward, during study time, the involvement in university really teach us about experiential learning. Whatever in the lecture hall is like academic or theoretical to pass exam, to graduates and so on, right? But the core values that bring us to the Labor force, atau bila kita bekerja ni, pengalaman yang dibina semasa kita involved with peoples, with the policy, um, to seek for approval dengan VC dan sebagainya, that's count as a start. That's really count as a start. So um, after graduated in chemistry, uh, I worked as chemist for like two years in industry, manufacturing industry and then move forward upgrading my resume during that time not a LinkedIn members yet during that time so I don't have LinkedIn profiles so it's just based on resume based on the interview skills uh, dan sebagainya so managed to secure my positions as a trainer in a consulting firm that's how my career start as a trainer and involved with a lot of graduates employability initiative agenda programs and work very close with talent before I joined LinkedIn so um, after 2012, I start build up my professional branding at LinkedIn. This is how LinkedIn took place in every single members who have their presence at LinkedIn. Don't just have photos, name appear on LinkedIn. Every single sections and compartment segments at LinkedIn have implicit and explicit data keywords inside to the recruiters. Recruiters scouting talent at LinkedIn. So based on the talent bank survey last uh, year, which is 2022, throughout 2022, what is the top um, platform for job seekers uh, to, to find a job? Number one is LinkedIn, right? In Malaysia, we talk about Malaysia. So I admit that. So every year, starting 2012, 13, up to 2022, after 10 years, every year I will make sure there's a right keywords appear on my profile. Because every year when we have our job intervention, we have programs, we have projects, we have initiatives, right? So just go and update your profile. Because every single keyword, words, very meaningful at LinkedIn. LinkedIn is um, what we say in terms of the AI. Our AI do the job to match from one members with the opportunity created by employers. So just go upskill yourself from LinkedIn point of view, we have LinkedIn learning. So when you apply for a certain job at LinkedIn, there will be some sort of like what your profile have skills, let's say you have 10 skills, right? And what about this job position require? Let's say this position require uh, 11 skills that you only match three skills only. What about the rest of eight skills? So you can go to LinkedIn learning and leverage on these certain skills and tie it back to your profile. It's more on the tactical also with, with, in terms of the members using LinkedIn. It's a strategy. Yes, it's a part of job hunting strategy, as, can, as I can say. And the way you approach direct to the recruiters who post the job, it's about networking. That's how people, what is the reason people have LinkedIn? Networking. What is the reason? Other reason than networking. To find a better career opportunity, especially for employ, uh, employed per people or even for fresh graduates. And the third one, now it is employers or even organizations see LinkedIn to help them retain their employees in terms of upskilling, reskilling, because we do have LinkedIn learning to support on the learning, lifelong learning culture to cultivate this kind of bite size learning, one minute, three minutes, five minutes, that's it. Even we have some sort of like nano tips and so on, that's how the ecosystem. At LinkedIn, we start with plan your talent management and then you go and hire them and you attract them to work with you. And the, the last part is retain your employees. So in terms of the LinkedIn point of view, on top of resumes, on top of the other soft skills needed, yes, admit that. So last year, 2022, I didn't apply for this job at LinkedIn. It is for the, my habit every year updating my LinkedIn dis, uh, descriptions 
and in, I mean, in terms of experience, right? We put our current positions, which company that we are working with, and the description. Don't let this part blank and go empty. So put in terms of what is the, in terms of students, I always address this. Don't put every, sorry, don't make every single segment at LinkedIn empty. It's just wasting your presence there. What's for? Your objective tak capai lah, ROI tu tak ada lah for the sake of having a presence. Cannot, the algorithm AI tak boleh buat kerja. Sebab tak ada benda yang boleh tarik your profile untuk match dengan any job availability dekat LinkedIn. So I just update my profiles dekat LinkedIn and May 2022, LinkedIn start approach based on the skills, based on the keywords, based on my profiles I can say. And there will be five stages to manage and secure this position and working with LinkedIn. Yep, this will be my 11th month with LinkedIn, still new. I'm still new, so um, I'm holding the accountability to foresee higher education specifically under my portfolio. And in Malaysia standpoint, we have 30 employees, LinkedIn Malaysia, and for higher education and public sector, it's only me all alone to taking care. And that's the reason why every single initiative in terms of the data, statistics, we need to tie it back and how LinkedIn can support our national talent in moving forward. I think that's all. Thank you so much, Doctor. Thank you. That's a lot of information there. Okay, that means I need to build up a pro my professional brand in LinkedIn. Yeah, there's a lot of work that we need to, to get our students ready before we head out the graduates. Okay, uh, I'm mindful of the time, so I shall open for one or two questions because this is already, we are encroaching into the lunchtime. Any questions from the floor? Questions from the floor? I'll add okay. Yes, please. Yes, no questions. Um, you know, sometimes in the classroom also, I'll say, to student, do you have any question? Nobody put up their hand. Nobody want to ask questions. So I assume everybody understand. So I think uh, one of the things that I would like to raise, uh, also echo from you, qualification is not really that important, right? You said just now. What is important is attitude. I've seen students having masters, having PhD, but they couldn't find a job. It's very, very frustrating. So again, what I'm trying to say is that. We have to emphasize on the student that upon the degree is, is not enough. They have to go extra. They have to find something beyond the degree. What is that something beyond the degree? I could not tell them also. Industry changed a lot. So they have to keep up with industry. What industry want? They have to look. They have to keep on doing their search. The university also have to keep on doing their work. You cannot have the same procedure, the same uh, structure. I'll give you an example. I approached University of Malaysia Sabah three weeks ago. We have this program we call Industrial Relations uh, Program under the Faculty of Social Science and Humanities. I'm very, very interested in this program because I am also a lecturer in that program and I produce a lot of students in those programs. And my students, after five years, they earn five, six thousand. After five, six years, because of course, one or two years, they only earn like three thousand. Now, the skills that they need is, of course, uh, conducting inquiry, investigation in the workplace, identifying problems, dispute resolutions. So I've seen a very good potential at UMS because they have this, what they call a moot court, you know, under the uh, uh, Faculty of Social Science and Humanities. So we, we, we put up an idea to them, okay, look, let's come up together and do a workshops, uh, one day workshops where I'll bring industry to your university, about 20 industry has already signed up, and you bring your student and your lecturer so that we work together and see how each of us performs uh, in the afternoon doing the role play. So in the morning, we do uh, some kind of, uh, what do you call that, theoretical and conceptual uh, uh, a lecture. But in the afternoon, we are going to do a role play and we get the students, the lecturers and the industry to perform a case study and we evaluate them as, as, as industry and we see how they perform. Oh, that way, it can build up the skills of the students, especially students who are doing masters. So, of course, we charge industry, you know, uh, university, we don't charge them, we give them compliments because they allow us to use their facilities, but for industries, we use, utilize Human Resource Development Corporation's funding. So that's maybe that's the way forward because we know that, I don't know whether what I'm proposing is wrong, but I think we want to see that students or graduates are in the end becoming an an employee to the industry. I think it is wise that we uplift them. So what we can do is maybe industry and university works together at the university to 
upgrade the skill of the students. I think I always tell my students also, you, you've seen my lecture almost every day. If, you, if I give you another lecture day in day, I, I mean the same thing. You need to go and meet the industry. You need to go and see the industry. What else do they want? That's why I send my students to do their work, you know, like assignment. They have to have industry element in their assignment. Because otherwise they do and cut and paste. If you just write, ask them, can you write an article, three pages article? They cut and paste. And, and like these days, it's easy to cut and paste. There's a lot of AI technology that you can just use to write email, to draft your email, to draft, you know, you just go to, what do you call it, chat GPT? You just type an issue, they will write to you one full page of story. So this is not the skill that we want from the student. We can detect, you know, as industry. If I look at the way you email to me, it's so perfect with no error, I can suspect that this must be an AI job. You, you agree with me or not? <laughs> okay, that, that is my comment. So maybe uh, one of the uh, way forward, I know we've been doing this. I was the director of the University Industry Center once at Unimas. I've been trying to bring in industries. It's not easy to bring industries, but you have to convince industry what is uh, the win-win situation for them. They don't have time. Industry don't have time. You want industry to review your curriculum? I will not be doing that because I have a lot of jobs to do. I have a lot of works to do. I wouldn't have time to look into your curriculum one by one. I can, but... You expect me to come to the university for one week to review your curriculum is not easy. Even, even at the university also, when you review curriculum, you're subject to MQA. It's not, you cannot just simply change. You know, so maybe, maybe there are other ways. What do you want the end is not just the curriculum, but the outcome that the student get through uh, industry experience, you know, maybe they cannot get work experience, but at least industry insight that they must secure before they, they graduate. I think that is the, the way forward that I can put, you know. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so um, I think we've come to the end of it. Uh, so on that note, please join me in thanking all the speakers for this session. Okay, member of the audiences, thank you very much. I would like to extend our deepest gratitude to our panelists for sharing their knowledge and experiences in addressing the importance of data for informed decision making and shaping the workforce of the future. On that note, uh, I would like to invite Dr. Yong Zulina to give away our token of appreciation to the panelists, please. Thank you once again, moderator and panelists. Ladies and gentlemen, almost 1, uh, 1 p.m. at this point in time, everyone is, I believe everyone given plus minus, I would say, an hour break to replenish back all the glucose that has been lost for morning session. So let us indulge ourselves with a hearty meal for lunch to bring back the energy for afternoon session at 2 p.m. So lunch is served uh, at the hall foyer and guests can grab their meal and enjoy it inside the hall. It will be a great pleasure for me and also the organizer uh, to have all attendees to be inside the hall before 2 p.m. But before that, uh, the prayer room is located at the lower ground of the Faculty of Creative Art Building, which is located uh, at the right side of the hall. Okay, so I think that's all. Please enjoy your lunch. Thank you very much. I hope to see you guys uh, during the afternoon session. Thank you very much.